Hello everybody, and thank you very much for tuning in tonight to listen to this presentation. My name is Brian Sloan, and I work for the Centre for Community Archaeology based at Queen's University in Belfast. And we're here tonight to talk briefly, I want to say briefly over the next half hour or so, about, um, about excavations that were carried out at a place called Fanning's Fort that's located in Cornerhove Townland County, Armagh. Now Cornerhove is, is a small townland and it's, it's, it lies to the west of uh, Cross McLean and northwest of Cullerville in the South Armagh. Uh, the project took place in 2016 and was carried out uh, by ourselves um, at Queen's. Uh, we were called the Centre for Archaeological Fieldwork at that time. Um, in association with the Ring of Gullion Landscape Partnership, we also funded uh, the investigation and we're, we're thankful to them for facilitating, but also to the landowners, the Machin family, who are putting up with us really over, over the month. We were there for about four weeks. Uh, the project was uh, primarily focused as what we call a community led investigation. And by that I mean we invited members of the local community and particularly uh, primary school children along to give us a hand investigating the site and, uh, and the kids especially uh, tried their hand at excavating and they thought about how to identify artifacts and how to identify archaeology and archaeological features and so on and so forth. And we do that to try, try and give a local community an ownership of a monument in their, in their local environment. So what is Fanning's Fort? Well Fanning's Fort is a type of monument that we call a raft or a ring fort and uh, these, these are very common feature in the yeah. As I say these are very common feature in the Irish landscape and, and they're dirt dotted all around the place. Um, basically back in the day, the date to the early medieval period somewhere around between maybe 700 AD and, and uh, 1200 AD and um, basically they were a, a defended farmstead. They're characterized usually by, by ditches and by banks and by palisades and all this would be protecting the interior where you might have two, three, four uh, circular houses but also areas for animals and, and metalworking and this that and the other and this is just a little model of what a raft might have looked like in its heyday. It's estimated that there are approximately 47,000 of these uh, rafts or ring forts known about on the island of Ireland. You can see from the map here they are kind of widely spread all over the island, but there are distinct clusters, particularly in, in Munster, in Connacht, and in Ulster. Uh, this number of 47,000 is likely to be an underestimation. These sites are constantly turning up, especially in uh, development lead archaeology in advance of major housing developments or route schemes where archaeologists would, would go in prior to the builders to, to record and to excavate any archaeological features that might be adversely affected by the development. Uh, and, and, and ring forts and rafts are a very common find on these sites. So, so as I say, the 47,000 is, is maybe a, a bit of a a bit of a conservative estimate about how many of these things were actually uh, in, in use during the early medieval period in Ireland. I think it's quite interesting to think about that because there is, it's an indication of the sheer population of the island. You know, you are getting an idea that there are so many of these sites that Ireland, Ireland was an absolutely bustling place 12 to 1300 years ago. Um, if we look a wee bit closer at our kind of uh, area of interest now, uh, just outside of Cross Milgain and Colville, uh, we get an idea about, about this clustering and about these, these sheer number of these sites that there is in the Irish landscape. This little image is taken from the Historic Environment Division's uh, map viewer uh, that's widely accessible on the internet and, it, and it's, uh, it's fantastic just to go if you're interested in an area, just to have a wee look and see what it's about. So if we look, uh, this little red dot here signifies Fanning's Fort, the site that we were excavating in 2016. But all the other little green dots around it are an archaeological site, and the majority of them do date to this early medieval period. 
of prime importance we have the Samri graph, which is a, which is what we call a multi-valid ring porter graph, and by that we mean it's just got more than one bank or ditch. And these banks and ditches are traditionally seen as a sign of wealth, so we can we can make the assumption that whoever uh, constructed the Samri fort and actually lived in it was was quite well to do, was a, was, a, was a big person in the local vicinity. Also we have a Corliss graph across Loch Ross as well that's got a mighty fine uh, pseudorain that's still extant that you can actually get down into it and climb around. If you're doing just be careful with the badgers, badgers tend to like to live in these pseudorains. But as well as Loch Ross as well, and you can see a number of green dots actually in Loch Ross itself, and these signify a site like we call Cranobs. Uh, Cranobs are a man-made island, and um, traditionally date to the early medieval period, really kind of around the same time as Raths and Ringforts as well, so they're all, all seen as kind of being interdependent on each other. But what we're, what we're actually doing is we're actually get building up an idea that this area of South Armagh really is a fossilised early medieval landscape. We have all these sites and they're all intervisible with each other and they're all connected in some way. Also shown in this map is the River Fane. Now the River Fane today uh, is, is a political boundary. It, 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 it separates uh, Armagh, which is in Northern Ireland, with Monaghan, which is in the Republic of Ireland. Um, but it was likely that this was a major uh, territorial boundary stretching right back in the ancient times, right back into the medieval period, when it was when it was uh, the the boundary between two ancient terries that we know as the Fews and the Farney. And this is likely to stretch right back into the early medieval period when we're talking about about uh, Fanning's Fort, but maybe even further back in the prehistoric times, so it's a, it's a major political and territorial boundary that is still extant in the landscape. This is an image just taken from the interior of Fanning's Fort, and it gives you an idea about the intervisibility of all these sites. Um, we have one of the Cranops that is located on Loch Ross, and Loch Ross is a very interesting loch, not just that it kind of spans north and south uh, today but uh, just for the, his the history of the site as well and it was on one of these Cranogs it's reputed that the 1641 rebellion was actually planned by Phelan O'Neill. We also have Corliss Rath which is uh, which is uh, denoted by this line of trees just on the horizon as well as Lizamri Rath and um, I do apologize this this picture doesn't really show it it's just on the top of this little drum one to the right of the picture. So we're getting this idea that everything is intervisible with each other. So you know, you're kind of thinking if these sites are contemporary, you know, they, they must be connected. The people in Corliss knew, the people in Lizamri who knew whoever constructed Fanning's Fort, who knew whoever was living on the Cranog, maybe they're all the one site type, they all belong to the same people. So this is Fanning's Fort as it sits today. You can see it's quite an upstanding monument on top of the uh, of the drumlin. But who who might have built it, or or when might have been constructed? Uh, the history of early medieval Ireland is quite convoluted and complicated. But it would appear that during the early medieval period, this raft lay within the territory of the Urther, who at that time occupied most of the modern county. Of Armagh in the early medieval period. Uh, the Arthur were the constituent part of the Agalia, who were the ruling dynasty in kind of uh, south and mid Ulster at the time. Following the expansion in the 9th century, around about 800 AD, of the Kennel Owen, it would, it would seem that this area quickly became clients of the Kennel Owen. Uh, the monument itself. Uh, today sits a uh, sits as a high bank on the north and the east. Uh, on the south and the west, it has become uh, gradually denuded and worked into uh, into the field boundaries of that area. And we'll, we'll explain a wee bit more about that when we come to the maps in a minute or two. But if we look at the bank, uh, certainly on the north and to the east of the monument, you know it stands at some some places over two meters high. So it's quite, it's quite a 
quite an imposing monument when you're when you're certainly outside it looking up into it. It's located on top of the Drumlin and the uh, Cornerhove itself as a townland lies within the Drumlin belt which extends from the, the uplands of south and east Armagh to the south of Loch Ney. And it would appear, um, certainly later on when we talk about the episcopation itself, it would appear that the makers of this monument have actually utilised the top of the Drumlin uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a way of building the rath. It, it meant that they didn't need to dig such a deep ditch to provide material for the bank. The site uh, is uh, depicted on all the Ordnance Survey maps. Um, if we look at this, this is the earliest Ordnance Survey map dating to the 1830s, and you see Corner Hove just in the bottom left hand corner. Um, this gives you an idea of, of, of the general landscape as well, of what, uh, what the map makers were actually seeing. We can see Les Amory Fort just to, the, just to the upper right. We can see Tullyard Fort just to the uh, northern shore of Loch Ross, and we can also see the Cranachs in Loch Ross itself. But if we look closer at Fanning's Fort at Cornerhove, we can see it's depicted as, as a circular monument. So uh, we, we would make the assumption that the bank were on all the way around the monument, certainly in the 1830s. If we look at the general landscape, we can see that it's unenclosed. Uh, Fanning's Fort is just sitting sitting out on its own so to speak as we into the the revision the second edition map the revision of the 1850 1850s we can see that the, the landscapes can become a lot more enclosed and fields have started to be have started to be laid out um this is this is the point where where corner hove starts getting altered and and really just exists as as a curvilinear field boundary depicted here in red you can see to the west and to the south um, it, uh, sort of a rectilinear arrangement of fields has been has been established you know so it's so really only to the north and to the east that this monument is visible to to the um the map makers of the 1850s What's also interesting is this uh, linear field boundary just uh, going beyond the um, the red line there towards the buildings around about the middle of the picture. And uh, this this is actually gone now. It's, it's an old field boundary. It's a field boundary that dates to the, the mid 19th century, but we were able to pick it up when we did the geophysical survey. Um, so this map is, is quite interesting because it shows a development in the landscape that wasn't there in the first edition map of the 1830s and you know you're, you're kind of getting an image that the, the land starting to be parceled up and agriculture is, is starting to take place and um, quite organized agriculture is starting to take place in this landscape so prior to the excavations we we carried out a geophysical survey across the site and basically this was to give us uh, hints and ideas of uh, of where we should target trenches. Um, we carried out two uh, different types of geophysical survey. The first was a, what we call a magnetometer survey and this tests uh, variations in the soil's magnetism and the kind of theory behind that is that if you've got a hearth or if you've got a, a furnace or if you've got a a deep ditch it all changes the mag magnetism of the earth in the in the in the very kind of localized spot and the machine should pick it up unfortunately uh, you can see from the image on the left there there wasn't an awful lot of targets for us to actually to actually pinpoint uh, all these kind of black dots have been interpreted by our geophysicist dr shabal mcdermott as representing uh, scrap metal so it maybe as uh, bits of tractor that have fallen off when the plow has gone over or the likes are very small little fires maybe or or burnt refuse that's been dumped on the land the second survey we carried out and you can see it on the right hand image there is what we call earth resistance survey and this this is a probe and if anybody has ever watched time team they can see the lads walking up and down the field it's actually a probe that fires a, a electrical current into the soil and the theory about it is is that if the electrical current 
hits uh, something dry and stony like a wall, it'll come back very weak because because that sort of that sort of uh, material does not conduct electricity. But if the signal goes through something that's nice and deep and wet, um, like a ditch, it'll come back very strong because water conducts electricity. So it would appear from this the right hand image, and certainly if we highlight it, that we have quite a strong linear anomaly that's running north-south from the rat towards the buildings. But this coincides very well with that field boundary that was on the, the second edition revision map of the 1850s. So we actually talk about the excavation itself. We um, we excavated five trenches in total. Three of them were located on the interior of the rath. One trench two was located over over the bank at the ditch of the monument, and one trench three was located outside the monument. And this is really uh, this really had a, a twofold sort of a purpose. It had a purpose of it was a it was like a test trench to see what was going on in the environs of this monument but as well this provided the focus of the primary school involvement to try and get them to, to dig up uh, artifacts related to the use of the site as a farm and hopefully earlier artifacts as well for use of the site during the early medieval period and um, this is the, the first trench we excavated across the interior of of the fort itself and it measured in the region of 15 meters by, by one meter and so it was, it was a more of an evaluation trench to see what type of stuff that we would be encountering and located just right across the center of the monument we think we would get we would be tripping over archaeology we did get subsoil cut features now we did get uh, areas of interest and we got quite excited about about this uh, this is a, a, a like a linear feature you're talking it's about a foot a foot and a half maybe in width and um, you know when, when, we're, when we're digging these sites we're expecting house foundations we're expecting you know hearts and this that and the other you know so we was actually getting quite exciting and quite uh, potential that we had uh, a structure related to early medical period however when we excavated a section across it we actually found that it was very shallow but as well as that the sides of it were quite sharp and there was there was little kind of straight steps in it almost as if somebody had dug it out with a spade. Coupled with that, we got shards of um, transfer pr printed pottery. We got shards of black glazed earthenware, all of kind of a 19th century date. So it quickly became apparent that this feature represents little more than a spade cultivation ridge. And you can see these things all over the landscape. Uh, basically, they're, they're potato rigs, they're for, they're for growing potatoes in the, in the 19th century. And I think this activity relates to the the the, the second edition map, where where we can see that kind of development of the landscape and the and the increased use of the land for agriculture. We excavated uh, two other trenches, in the interior of the Rath, but curiously found absolutely nothing. It was very shallow topsoil. It came straight onto the natural subsoil, and there was no features or there was no artifacts of an early medieval period or early medieval date you know which is very curious because other rats that have been found that people have been living in uh, you've been absolutely tripping over the archaeology we should have been getting bucket loads of suturing more pottery this is a this is like a, a coarse unglazed pottery that was very common in in this part of ireland really in the early medieval period but we were getting absolutely nothing bar and post medieval pottery and meals. The trench that we dug uh, across the bank of the ditch did actually provi provide uh, prove a bit more fruitful and what we actually encountered was a shallow ditch that encircles the monument and so this is the little section of the ditch that you can see taken out there. Now when I say shallow it was, it was just under a meter deep which for a rath ditch is quite shallow but again if we think about these people are utilizing uh, a drumlin and what they've done is they've, they've utilized the slope of the drumlin uh, to enhance the height of the bank so that meant that they didn't need to dig down so deep into their ditch to provide material 
to construct the bank. This is the trench that produced our one and only stratified find from the whole excavation dating to the early medieval period. And it was this is a very small fragment of, of furnace lining. So basically it's just burnt clay. But on the other side, so we've got the, the nice kind of the reddish oxidized clay. So shown in this image on the other side, we can actually see fragments of iron slag adhering to the clay. So this is an indication that there is industry happening and um, they are processing metal. They are they are working metal in the vicinity of this rat. Now we didn't we didn't encounter any furnaces. We didn't encounter any any iron slag or any any metal artifacts to tell you the truth either. But this one little shirt does tell us that in the vicinity of this ditch, they were processing iron ore into usable metal. Um, this is just a shot showing you uh, the, the amount we dug in the interior. Now, you know, I say we peppered the interior with trenches. We really only dug three relatively small holes. And we worked it out, it worked out around about two and a half percent of the available area of the inside of the monument. So it could be that we actually missed the archaeology and the archaeology is still there to be found. But I don't think so. You would you would expect even in these small trenches uh, where we located them, certainly in the middle of the monument, you would have expected some sort of indication had people been living here constantly. You would expect their material culture to be in the soil. Um, we know that there was agriculture happening here from the 19th century at the very least. And I don't think it's fair to say that that agriculture has taken away any of the archaeological deposits and um, because we would still be finding the material culture. And um, it's just one of them ones where I think that the material culture wasn't there to begin with. So then we've got to think about what this monument might actually be. Um, we are getting a picture now that people weren't actually living in the monument, but somebody has gone to the bother of creating this quite a quite impressive looking, it certainly is impressive looking in 2016. Uh, you think about what it might have been and looked like back in the early medieval period. One idea is that because Cornerhove lies on this political boundary, um, you know, it's just off from the Fane River. One of, one of the ideas is that it might actually be a, a protected area for cattle. During the medieval, early medieval period, cattle were your wealth. Um, Ireland was non-monetary. Non there was no coinage in Ireland until the Normans invaded. And certainly in Ulster, the Normans invaded in 1177 and brought coinage with them. Uh, prior to that, uh, a man's wealth was shown by, by how many cows that he actually that he actually owned and if we if we look at the Breton laws the ancient law tracks of Ireland we can see the value of a cow and you know it's kind of pitted against different different industries and pitted against different professions as well so what we might actually have is a defended area to to keep cattle uh, during their medieval period and that would explain why um, why we aren't getting material culture associated with people. It's just people weren't living here. Maybe cows were living here. Another idea is because we got the, the fragment of the of the furnace lining, another idea is that we might actually have an area set aside for industry. And if we if we think back to to all the other sites in the general area, the likes of Les Amri, the likes of Corliss, the likes of the Crano, could we be looking at an area that's set aside for industry and particularly industry associated with iron working? Uh, iron working is a very it's a very dangerous pastime. The the furnaces get up to a very high temperature and you wouldn't want them anywhere near your, your habitation. You wouldn't want them anywhere near your buildings or anywhere near where your children were running about even. Um so you know, are we looking at somewhere that's kind of set aside for that sort of specialist craft sort of industry sort of sort of activity i'm not so sure about this idea i kind of think it more along the lines of of a protected enclosure for cattle 
uh, primarily because if if this if corner holes or fanning support was reserved for industry surely we would have picked up a lot more evidence of it than just one little shirt of furnace lining uh consequently uh, on on the um, uh, the reverse side of that we only executed a very small amount of the monument but still you would imagine we would have encountered some sort of burning we would have got uh, we would have got layers of charcoal we would have got layers of industrial waste like slag we would have got iron artifacts as well and um, this little one shirt of stratified furnace lining is interesting it is early medieval and it is located at the very bottom of the ditch but really all is telling us that industry was happening somewhere in the vicinity of that fort it may have been in the interior but again we would have expected to find the evidence in there so getting back to the basics of this project the whole focus of this was uh, what we call a community-led investigation and I said before that's where we invite members of the local community out to give us a hand and find out what life is like being an ar a field archaeologist in Ireland so this these are pupils of one of the local primary schools in Cross McLean who came out to to help us excavate and let's say they excavated in the trench just outside of the fort um, primarily because of the chance that the, they could they could actually excavate through deposits and and find a uh, find a part of the site's story and what they were actually finding were artifacts relating to the use of the site during the 19th and 20th century as a farm so they were picking up uh, bits of clay pipes they were giving up picking, picking up uh, bits of uh, pottery and glass that had been that had been probably incorporated onto the site through the act of middening but it wasn't just it wasn't just the excavation that the kids had a chance to take a part in we also took groups with them and taught them how to identify artifacts and how to how to record different artifacts as well and what we're trying to do is give them a sense of ownership into this monument and an ownership into archaeology and try and teach them that uh, that heritage doesn't belong to anybody in particular and it belongs to everybody it doesn't belong to archaeologists it doesn't just belong to landowners it belongs to everybody in the community and it's, and it's great to see their little their little faces light up you know when they find just a, a weird shaped stone in the trench you know it's 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 fantastic and just to think that you know we might have budding archaeologists within the school group uh this site was excavated in 2016 you know so you know you're talking what about five years ago so an awful lot of these 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 pupils will be will be kind of GCSE age now, you know, and hopefully they'll remember the dig in Corner Hove and start maybe, you know, if they're interested in history, start making choices that will actually eventually lead them on to study in archaeology and become an archaeologist. Um I just I just included this image because obviously it was it was the excavation crew that uh, that carried out all this work and engaged with the public and we just thought it was great that we had all these signs uh, leading in the roads around Corner Hove as well and just wondering if some of them signs might actually still be up there and I'd love one for my collection. But a big shout out to this young lad, this is the youngest of the McShane family. The McShanes are the current landowners of Corner Hove, of Fanning's Fort. And this young lad was fantastic. He used to he show great enthusiasm and he came up every single day uh, and uh, so, you know the weather was very nice when we were up there it was may it was lovely kind of, kind of hot and he he always brought us ice lollies which was very much appreciated by myself and by the whole excavation crew and uh, when we were leaving we decided to present him with his own archaeological trial and uh, and you know he was, he was probably around about 10 11 years of age back then you know so he's probably of what 15 16 and hopefully uh, young McShane will be will be uh, visiting Queen's University Belfast soon and um, studying as an archaeologist. He'll make a fantastic archaeologist. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to say thank you to a number of people who made the project a success. Uh, Darren Rice and all the folks at the Ring of Gully and Lancy Partnership Scheme, they organise absolutely everything and facilitated, uh, facilitated the investigation. Uh, the, the McShane family were absolute troopers and thank you for their unwavering support and enthusiasm for the project 
and I, I do mean this without without your help and without your enthusiasm this could never have got off the ground and been the success that it was the excavation crew of course we worked through through all sorts of weather you know just to get the job done and but particularly as well all the school groups who participated throughout the excavation uh, we'll hopefully see some of you again hopefully some of you are actually listening to this now and uh, come to Queen's and do your degree in archaeology uh, thank you very much for listening to me tonight